Good Sunday morning, Old Zion and all of our YouTube guests. I am so glad to be back with you uh, for another one of these exciting Sunday School lessons that we're having now out of the Old Testament. We're beginning a new quarter. Uh, we're in the fall quarter, and we are studying about obedience, and uh, today specifically obedience in leadership. I regret that we weren't able to be together last week. Uh, just a perfect storm of events kept that from happening, but uh, I'm excited to be here with you this week. All right, and we're going to get right into the scripture text. Our scripture comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. As always, though, I do want to invite you to partner with us not by giving us money, not by doing any great huge feats uh, that you have to put forth a lot of effort. Just do some simple things like click the thumbs up button here on the YouTube channel. Leave a comment below. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And share the links to these videos on your social media platforms. Help us reach the world with the everlasting gospel of the kingdom before Christ comes. All right. So thank you for partnering with us in doing those things. And as we get into the lesson, uh, or we get ready to get into the lesson rather, uh, you, you know how these lessons usually work. Now I know a lot of you who are listening to these are Sunday school teachers or else very active in your Sunday school discussions. And one of the things that I like to do is to prepare you with some background knowledge so that you better understand what's going on in the text. And also address some, some questions, some concerns that not only scoffers, but serious students of the Bible might, might have some confusing things that may be in the text. And we're going to do that today. So we're going to look at the text. We're going to look at, at the, the big idea in the text. But before we do that, I, I do want to address some points of, of interest, some points that may help you in your Sunday school uh, discussions. Okay, so we're going to get right into the text today. And it's in Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a, from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Now, we can say this, I'm sure, about most any text out of the scriptures, especially the Old Testament stories, but the providence of God is on full display here. And remember by providence, all we mean by that is the hand of God guiding all the events of history, all the events of our lives, everything that comes to pass being decreed by God to bring about God's eternal plan and God's eternal purpose, right? All things. Uh, good things, bad things, uh, the things that the righteous do, the evil that evil man, men do, ultimately will all bring about the good will and the good purpose of God. Now, know this, that this episode that we see here, this, this burning bush episode, it's not a spur-of-the-moment thing. It's not an afterthought. Uh, God wasn't just sitting around twiddling his thumbs and seeing Moses afar off and saying, hey, you know what, he'd be a good guy to go lead my people out of Egypt. Right? That's not what's going on here at all. And oftentimes providence is best seen from hindsight. Right? Moses had totally missed this. Uh, 
we, uh, being blessed by looking back at the whole story, can see providence a lot better than Moses could at this point. But look at all of the things that God had done throughout the life of Moses to bring him to this place, to this point, to this uh, meeting with God here at the burning bush. Right? If you remember the story of Moses, you know the story of his life. How that when he was born, he was literally born under a death sentence. Pharaoh had decreed that all the male children of the Israelites were going to be killed at birth. And uh, so this idea of population control, of getting rid of people by killing infants, is nothing new, right? In our day, we call it abortion. In Moses' day, it was the command of Pharaoh to kill the newborn male infants. And he survived that. God protected him. His parents hid him. God protected him until they could no longer hide him anymore. They make a little ark out of bulrushes. They cover it with pitch so that it's waterproof. They put him in this little boat put him afloat on the Nile, and literally give him into the hands of God, praying that God would protect him, and God does, providentially protects him. And then he's found, and who's he found by? He's found by the daughter of Pharaoh, no less, and adopted by her, raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised as a son of Pharaoh. Now think about this. After this event that we read here, Moses is going to lead a bunch of slaves, millions of people, out of slavery. He's going to lead them into a wilderness. He's got to organize them. He's got to provide for them. He's got to give them some system, some form of government. He's got to teach them religion. He's got to teach them how to worship God. He's got to keep them all going in the same direction and not to give up and quit or to scatter or to stay behind. He's got to do a lot of things. He's going to have to serve as their general. He's their spiritual leader. He's their political leader. He's their military leader. Moses is going to have to do all of these things. That's a lot of hats to wear. But look how he was raised. He was raised as faithful. Pharaoh's son in the court of Pharaoh, trained in how to rule, trained in government. He grew up learning military science and theology and philosophy, how to think rationally. He grew up learning all of these skills that he's going to need to do the work of God. Now that's providence. That's the hand of God guiding the life of Moses to bring him to this place. Even the sin that he commits that, that causes him to flee Egypt. Uh, he kills an Egyptian because this Egyptian is mistreating a Hebrew slave. And later he leaves because his sin is found out and he flees as a fugitive from justice. But even that sin brings him to the household of Jethro. It brings him to this place at Horeb where he can have this meeting with God some 40 years afterwards. It's the hand of God leading him guiding him, even through his, his sinful deeds that he freely committed, God uses to bring him to this place. That's the hand of providence. If it's at work at Moses' life and child of God, even if you're not a child of God, whoever you are that's listening to this, the hand of God's providence is at work in you. You are listening to this lesson, not by accident, not just by a sheer act of your will. You are listening to this lesson, this teaching, because of the providence of God. God has providentially brought you here for this reason today. Okay? The hand of providence is at work. Now, let's talk a little bit about these Midianites. We need to understand about them just a little bit. Uh, let's, let's talk about who these guys are. Now, like Israel, they are also the children of Abraham. Okay? They're descended from Abraham through Abraham's son, Midian. Now, some of you might be thinking, but wait a minute, I know about Ishmael, I know about Isaac, but who's this Midian guy? Well, remember after the death of Sarah, uh, Abraham remarries. He marries a woman by the name of Keturah and has some children. And one of those children uh, is, a, is a son named Midian. And his descendants are called the Midianites. So they are a Semitic group. They are cousins, or, or I guess you could say, to Israel. And oftentimes when we see them in the scriptures, they are the enemies of God's people, right? They're the enemies of Israel. Um, but now Moses' father-in-law was a Midianite. Uh, he comes to this Midianite tribe. Uh, he was from the Kenite tribe. 
of the Midianites. And uh, they're going to be pretty famous. We're going to see them throughout Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, we're going to find that the uh, Kenites, uh, these in-laws of, of Moses, actually join Israel. They go into the promised land with them. They become a part of Israel, are assumed into the, into the, into the nation of Israel, and, and really become Israelites. So we see this Midianite group being adopted, being brought in to the people of God later. Okay, but they were the Kenites. Now, when we get to this episode in chapter 3, Moses had been living with the Midianites for 40 years. Okay, in chapter 3, verse 1, Moses is 80 years old. For 40 years, he had been living with the Midianites. He had married a Midianite girl, a lady by the name of Zephora, and uh, he'd been pasturing the flocks of his father-in-law, uh, been a part of their culture, part of their society for 40 years. So he's been there a long time. Now, if you read the scriptures and you know much about the Midianites, you'll find that the Midianite homeland was actually much further east than the Sinai Peninsula. Much further east. And they lived in cities. Uh, they had cities. They had towns. Uh, they, they were a civilized group. Uh, but there were a group of them. Some of the Midianites seemed to have migrated toward the, the, the west and had come to the Sinai Peninsula. And they lived as nomads. They pastured flocks. They traveled around pasturing their flocks of sheep and goats and whatever other animals they had. Uh, they were also known to be bandits, right? So they practiced a little banditry, uh, a little uh, animal husbandry, and, and they were living in the Sinai Peninsula. Now, that's important because originally the Sinai Peninsula had been settled, had been inhabited by the descendants of Cush. And when we read in Genesis about the descendants of Noah, we find that Cush uh, was the ancestor of most or many of those groups who live in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Below the Saharan Desert, below Egypt, uh, around Ethiopia, um, and then south, right? And so Cush was the ancestor of, of those folks. Now, the Midianites and some other Semitic groups had come into the Sinai Peninsula and, and pretty much pushed the Cushites east, or west, excuse me. They pushed the Cushites west and uh, into Africa, specifically into Ethiopia. Now, this was not an over-the-night process, and so there was some intermingling and some intermarrying of these Midianites and other Semitic groups with the Cushites, with uh, those folks who were living there. And so much so that this area uh, began to be known by this combined name. If you read in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 7, many, many years later uh, after this episode, uh, God uses a term for this area in this western part of the Sinai Peninsula uh, that is a combination of Midian and Cush, and he calls it Cushion in Habakkuk 3, 7. And so even the peoples there were, were seen as, as a mixture of some of the Cushites and Midianites, right? They, they, they called it Cushion. And most likely, this is the most likely explanation why in Numbers chapter 12, when Miriam, the sister of Moses, kind of rebels against Moses because she's jealous of his authority, jealous of the way that God is using Moses, uh, she attacks him for marrying a non-Israelite. And uh, the attack that she makes, she, she talks about Moses marrying this Ethiopian woman. Now, in the King James Version, it says Ethiopian woman. The actual Hebrew term there is Cushite. Right? He's married this Cushite woman, this woman who is a descendant of Cush. Well, our text in Exodus says that she was from a Midianite tribe, but there was this intermarriage. And uh, so her calling her a Cushite, she's putting them down. She's not even a Semitic, right? She's, she's this half Semitic, half, uh, half Cushite woman that Moses has married. And so that's why she calls her, in, in the King James at least, an Ethiopian or a Cushite woman because of the intermarriage that happened between these Midianites and the descendants of Cush. Now, Another thing that crops up, another thing that we need to talk about, and, and this may get asked in your Sunday school class at some point, is who exactly was the father-in-law of Moses? Who was his father-in-law? And you might say, well, in, in Exodus 3, 1 here, it says that his father-in-law was Jethro, and you're absolutely right. However, if you go back a chapter into Exodus chapter 2, and verse 18, when Moses first arrives with this Midianite band, uh, he, he meets this woman, Zephora, 
and she tells her father about him. It says her father, and his name is Rule. Okay, Rule. But in 3.1 it says it's Jethro. Now realize there's a span of about 40 years between Exodus 2.18 and Exodus 3.1. But she calls him Rule. Well, what's going on there? What's, you know, which one is, of these is actually the father-in-law of Moses? Well, there's, a, there's three possibilities. And this is based on the Hebrew text and the culture of the day. Now Moses' readers would have known. They would have understood this. But us being so far removed, we have to look back and we have to say, okay, what does the text say? What is the culture of the day? What is the situation? And there are three main possibilities. And I want you to know that even though there are three possible answers to this, to this question, uh, none of them are going to, um, none of them are going to strike at the truth of Scripture. Right? Scripture can be true, and, and any of these three can, can be true. Uh, a couple of them I'm not really sold on, and I'll tell you which one I believe here just in a moment. But one possibility is that Ruel, in Exodus 2.18, was Moses' father-in-law, that he was the father of Zephorah, he was Moses' father-in-law, and that he had died, and that his son Jethro was now in his father's place, in his father's position. Now, that does not contradict Scripture. These flocks and herds that uh, Moses were keeping, they would have still been uh, the flocks and the herds of rule. Uh, it's just now that he has passed and his son is in his position. That is a possibility. That's not what I think is going on here. I, I don't think that's the case, uh, but it is a possibility, and some commentators will say that. Now, the other possibility is that rule was the name of Moses' father-in-law, and that Jethro was his title. Jethro uh, means his excellence or his abundance. Um, and as the, the, the sheikh of this band, as the leader of this band, that could have very well been a, a title. Jethro could have been a title. His given name could have been Rule. And that is a very valid possibility uh, that it's referring to the same person, one with his given name, one with his title. And uh, that, 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 that could very well be the case. The third option, the third option, and it's the one that if you had to pin me down, uh, I would say I believe this is the case. I believe this is what's going on here, and uh, I could be wrong, and that's okay. It's neither here nor there. But the third option is that Rule is the father of Jethro. Rule is the father of Jethro. And that Jethro is the father-in-law of Moses. Now, it's true that in Exodus 2, uh, 18, that Zephora does call rule father. This comes to her father. Uh, but in nomadic societies, relationships were viewed a whole lot more broadly than they are in our culture. Um, you know, we like to pin everything down specifically, genetically, biologically. We like to pin it down and get it exact. Well, that wasn't always the case in nomadic societies. Uh, relationships were a lot broader. Um, you know, the, calling the leader of the family, the leader of the tribe father, calling the grandfather, who is the patriarch of the clan father, that would have not been out of the norm. And the Hebrew word that is used here, there is some evidence that this ancient Hebrew word uh, can refer to almost any male relative. So, uh, and remember, there's 40 years difference, 40 years difference between chapter 2 and chapter 3. So it is a very good possibility that Rule was actually the grandfather of Zephora and that his son Jethro uh, is now in his place and he is the father-in-law of Moses. But any, any of those could, could be valid, supported by the text. Um, pick the one that uh, you believe in light of the text is, uh, is the appropriate answer. But just realize there are some other possibilities, okay? So that's the father-in-law of Moses. We're going to say Jethro is the father-in-law of Moses because the text says that Jethro is the father-in-law of Moses. Now, it says about Jethro that he was also the priest of Midian. The priest of Midian. Now, this is important. He was the priest of Midian. Now, it is also common in these nomadic societies for the leader of the clan, the leader of the tribe, the leader of the group, to also serve as the spiritual leader as well. There's no separation of church and state here. Right, the the political leader of the group is also the spiritual leader of the group, and Scripture teaches us here that he was a priest of the one true God. 
So he's a priest of the one true God. Now, not all of the Midianites are going to be faithful worshipers of the true God, but this group was, and that Jethro was a priest of the one true God. We're actually going to see later in the book of Exodus, if you read on, that when Israel does come up out of Egypt, that Jethro makes a sacrifice to God, and it's acceptable to God, and that Moses and Aaron take part in that sacrifice. So he is a priest of the true God. Now that's important for us to know because sometimes we get the idea that nobody at this time in the world was worshiping the one true God except for Israel. And that is absolutely not the case. Now we're a long time removed from the flood. We're a long time removed from Babylon or from Babel rather. Uh, and, and it's true that most of the world, most of the Gentiles had, had devolved into paganism. That is true. But we do see even in scripture that there are a few non-Israelite folks who have retained the knowledge of the one true God and are still worshiping him uh, in the time of Abraham. We see the story of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek lived in that Jebusite city, Salem, later would be called Jerusalem, and he was called a priest of the Most High God, right? Melchizedek, even though he wasn't part of the covenant people, he had retained the knowledge of the one true God and served him. Also, we believe living about the same time as Abraham was Job, and Job worshipped the one true God. And here we have Jethro. So even amongst the Gentiles, there were pockets here and there of people who had retained the knowledge of the one true God. But Jethro here, even though he was a priest of God and made sacrifices and worshipped the one true God, uh, he was still walking in darkness. I mean, think of all the handicaps that Jethro had in his walk with God. I mean, he wasn't a part of the covenant people. Wasn't a part of Israel. Um, he wasn't a part of the promised line, uh, you know, descending through Isaac. Uh, he was not the recipient of revelation, uh, as Israel would be. Uh, he didn't have the fullness of the revelation of what the worship of God should be that would later come through Moses. He didn't have those things. Uh, he worshipped God. He made sacrifices to God based on what had been handed down to him through Abraham and Midian and the rest of the family. Uh, Worshipped him as best he could in the light of nature. Uh, Worshipped him as best he could with the, the oral tradition that had been handed down. So while he was very sincere in his worship of God, he was still worshipping imperfectly at this time. And uh, you might say, well, preacher, there's, there's folks like that today. They are sincere in their love for God, but they don't worship him according to what God has laid out in the scriptures. Uh, they, they don't worship him perfectly. They love the Lord, but they don't worship him perfectly. And you're right, there are people like that. But now Jethro had an excuse. We have no excuse. We have the completed revelation of God. So uh, don't lean on your ignorance as an excuse for not worshiping God as God has laid out to be worshiped in the scriptures. We have those things. You have that light, and you're accountable to God for how you worship God. Okay, he had an excuse we don't. But he was a true priest of God. Now, again, on this idea of providence, I mean, think about this. Of all the places Moses could have landed after leaving Egypt, of all those places, God providentially brought him to the household of a true priest. And not only to the household of a true priest, but a priest living by the mountain of God here in Horeb. Right? God brought him here training him in the household of Jethro. And he's been here for 40 years. He was 40 years old when he fled Egypt, been here uh, in Jethro's household, tending the flocks of his father-in-law for 40 years. And now at 80 years old, God is going to speak to Moses directly. Now, maybe we don't always catch that. Moses is 80 years old when God calls him. So some of you who are listening to the lesson may say, well, you know, my time has passed. I'm no longer a spring chicken. I'm not as uh, young as I used to be. I'm one of those seasoned saints. Well, it doesn't matter. In God's own time, God calls when he wills. And he willed to call when Moses was 80 years old. Now, the text says that this 80-year-old Moses was out in the wilderness, and he was grazing the flocks in Horeb, and he looks and he sees a bush that's on fire. Now, this would not have been an uncommon sight to see wildfires at these oases and these pasture areas in the wilderness here. Uh, lightning strikes, various other causes, things burned. It was not uncommon to see a bush on fire. But what struck Moses 
was that even though this bush was absolutely enveloped in the flame, it wasn't being consumed. Its leaves still green. Uh, the branches weren't being dissolved into ashes. The bush was not being consumed. And Moses would have assumed, it's safe to say that Moses would have assumed that this was a supernatural thing that was going on here. A supernatural thing. Because not only is God identified with fire in the scriptures, even the pagans uh, identified their gods with fire as well. They're false gods. They identified them with fire. And that shouldn't surprise us either. Because even though their sinful hearts were darkened, uh, even though they, they attributed the attributes of God to false gods and to idols, still a remnant, a small remnant of the truth about the one true God remained. They just attributed it to their idol gods. And so they had a remnant. They had a, they, they had a spark of the truth in them, but it was a misplaced truth, right? It was a misplaced truth. And that really shouldn't surprise us because even in the most vilest of sinners, even in the most depraved of sinners, the image of God in creation is still there. It may be terribly effaced, but it is not erased. It's still there. And so they had a remnant of the truth, not according to knowledge. right? So Moses would have assumed, this is something supernatural going on here. I want to see what's happening. Now, this fire is what we call a theophany. I know that's a big $5 theological term that you may never use. But if you do see that in a commentary, you do see it in a Sunday school literature somewhere, or your preacher pulls that term out, let me explain it to you. A theophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, the eternal Son of God. Okay, We know that Christ did not come into being in Bethlehem, that he is the eternal Son of God, he is God, he has existed from all eternity. And a theophany occurs in the Old Testament when Christ appears in human form sometimes, uh, sometimes here as, as a fire, but Christ appears physically uh, in these pre-incarnate days. Pre-incarnate just means before he took on flesh, before he took on humanity in the virgin's womb. Now, how do you know that this is Christ, preacher? How do you know that? I mean, the scripture doesn't say, hey, this is Christ. So how, how can you make that statement? Well, I can make that statement because of this. Uh, scripture says that this is the angel of the Lord. And I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I think you're going to see why here in a moment, that angel of the Lord here refers to Christ, the eternal Son of God. Okay. Now, the word angel just means messenger. Right? And those angelic beings are called angels because they are the messengers of God. Uh, in the New Testament, sometimes we see pastors referred to as angels because they are the messengers of God. Angel just means a messenger. It doesn't always refer to a specific class of created beings. This is the eternal word, right? Messenger, word, the eternal word of God. This is God the Son. Now, how do I know this? Because in this chapter, in this chapter, in this encounter, in this conversation that Moses and God have here, uh, this angel of the Lord, this, this being that is identified as the angel of the Lord, calls himself Yahweh. Right now, we used to, we used to write this as Jehovah uh, before we better learned uh, how ancient Hebrew handled its vows. It's Yahweh. Uh, Jehovah, if you want to still say Jehovah, this is Yahweh. So he, he identifies himself as the one true God, the eternal God, Yahweh. Uh, he says that he is the God of Abraham's father. He says that he is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Isaac. He is the God of Jacob. He's God. He claims to be God. No created angel would have done this. No creative angel would have said, I am God. Right? Only God would say that. Only God would say that with a straight face, right? So he calls himself God. So if this angel of the Lord calls himself God, I'm just going to go with the text and say, this is God. This is God the Son appearing to Moses. And he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, God will call himself I am several times in this chapter, and that's important, right? Yahweh, I'm going to, he's going to call himself I am several times. Well, what does it mean when God says, I am? Well, all that means is, I am the one who just is. That's all it means. I'm the one who just is. I am that being that is. In eternity past, I am. 
right now I am in the future I am there's never going to be a time that I am not I am the one who exists I am the self-existent one I'm the self-existent one now I know that uh, you know evolutionary uh, biologists and evolutionary physicists have tried to claim that uh, there is no um, eternal God that uh, the universe came into being because of sheer accidents of physics and chemistry and all of those things uh, happen by just chance but when you keep going back to you know causes and effects something has to start the process there there has to be an uncaused cause I mean, you can go back as far as you want to go back but there has to be something some being something in the very beginning that starts the whole process there has to be an uncaused cause right something that's eternal something that exists and God says I am that uncaused cause I am the one who just is the one who's eternal the one who always has been and always will be now, I know that this is God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, because in John 8, 58, Christ is having a, uh, I mean, he's coming to blows just about with the Pharisees. And, uh, and he tells them uh, that, uh, you, you know, Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. And they said, well, we know you're crazy. Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and you have a demon? You're just off your rocker. Abraham died a long, long time ago. You're not even 40 years old yet. How can you say that Abraham saw your day and rejoiced to see it? And Jesus says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Yahweh. He uses he uses the he uses the divine name. Now he, he says it in Greek, ego I me. I am. I am. He didn't say I was, not past tense. He says I am, present tense, always present tense with God, always is. He's the God who always is. He just is. I'm the one who is. Now, did you catch something else here? Now I just alluded to it a moment ago. Present tense. He doesn't say I'm the God who was. He doesn't say I'm the God who will be. I'm the God who am, who is, right now present tense all the time eternity past was present tense right now is present tense future present tense it's all one I am the God who just exists notice what he said I am present tense the God of your father I'm the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob now Abraham Isaac Jacob even Moses father were long dead by this point they were long dead but God speaks here in the present tense though they're dead yet they're still alive I'm still the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, your father. They're still alive. They're going to take part in the resurrection at the last day when Christ returns. They're alive. They haven't ceased to exist. I'm their God. I am their God in the past. I am their God now. I'm still their God in the future. And when Moses hears this, he hides his face. Now, you'll hear some of the little smart aleck TV preachers talk about seeing God and you know, seeing Christ and Christ coming to them and they're cutting up jokes with him and they're palling around with him and they've seen God. You may have heard, I'll, I'll say, I'll give them the benefit of that, even well-meaning believers say that, you know, they had this mystical experience and they saw Christ and, you know, they rode down the road with each other or whatever. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. Well, I'm going to go back to the scriptures and every time anyone ever saw God in some form, what did they do? They fell on their face. They hid their face. Moses hid his face. Uh, Isaiah just about melted down and said, Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Peter fell down at the feet of Jesus and said, Depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Paul fell to the ground on the Damascus Road. right? And Moses does the same thing. He sees God. And it says here in the text that he was afraid to look at God. Moses understands that this angel of the Lord is is God he hides his face so uh, next time you hear somebody talking about some experience where they were palling around with Jesus you just uh, uh, know that um, that does not follow the biblical pattern right it's not follow the biblical pattern and uh, I just don't think I would listen much to what they had to say now here's what God tells Moses he says I've not forgotten the promises 
that I've made to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I've not forgotten those promises. And so that Moses can understand, God speaks of himself here using human terms. Now, we know that God is all all, all present. We know that he's all-knowing. We know that God is spirit. He doesn't have parts like we have. He doesn't have a body like we have. Uh, we, we understand that. We know that. He doesn't have ears like we have ears or hands like we have. We understand that God, God the Father at least, God is a spirit. We understand that. But he speaks of himself in human terms here so that Moses can understand him. And we see that a lot in the scriptures. And so in the scriptures, when you read about the hand of God or the ear of God or the eyes of God, it's not saying that God looks like us. What it's saying is God is having to use human terms to explain himself so that we can understand him. And he says this. He speaks in very human terms here about himself. He says, I have seen the affliction of my people. I've heard their cries. I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them. Right? Now, we know that the all-present, all-knowing God was aware of the situation of his people from the very beginning. There was never a time he wasn't aware of what was going on. There was never a time he was not present with them. Uh, there was never a time that, that his eyes were blinded to what was happening. He has known all along their condition. But what he's saying now is, I've come down to deliver them now is the time that I have chosen to act right it was his will and it was his purpose that they stay there as long as they did and now that it was uh, time according to his will and purposes now God has chosen to act and God is going to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham he's going to give a physical land to these descendants of Abraham these descendants of Isaac these descendants of Jacob Right? And this land uh, that they're going to possess for a time is going to be the down payment. It's going to be the promise. It's going to be the physical representation of the promise that they have of an eternal land in the new heavens and the new earth at the end of the age when Christ returns. And he says this land that I'm going to give them, it's a spacious land. There's plenty of room for them. They're not going to be hemmed in to Goshen anymore. It's going to be a spacious land. And it's going to be a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Now, of course, that does not mean that there are rivers that literally flow with milk and rivers that literally flow with honey. What's God saying there? It's a land of sustenance, of nutrition. It can sustain you and feed you like milk. And it's a land of sweetness like honey. I'm going to take you to a land that is spacious, a land that can sustain you, that can satisfy your needs, and it's a land also of sweetness. You're going to come from slavery to sweetness. I'm going to bring this about. I'm going to bring it about. I'm going to fulfill the promises that I've made to Abraham. All right. Well, that's good, God. That, that, I mean, that's great. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. But God doesn't stop there. Uh, he says this. Even though that God is the deliverer of his people, we know that ultimately God is the one who is the deliverer of his people. We understand that. He says, I'm going to deliver my people. But even though that's the case, Moses is going to be the instrument that God will use to accomplish this work, right? And we know that God uses instruments, created things, to accomplish his eternal will. Well, now let's just stop here for a minute. Now, I know a lot of people. I've, I've known people like this. Uh, I've, I've been guilty of doing this in, in the past until I learned better, right, when I was a young Christian. And, and maybe you do this too. Maybe we think that when, uh, when God is going to move, we're waiting for some big, huge, supernatural thing to happen, right? The, the lightning is going to flash, and, and the smoke is going to roll, and the thunder is going to peal. And we have all of these things, right? And we're going to know some big supernatural thing is going to happen. And, and God does some supernatural miracles, right? God, God does some of those things. He's going to do some of those things through Moses, but most of the time, the normal way we see God working in the scriptures is through created, physical, real stuff. In this case, Moses. God's going to deliver his people, but he's going to use a real flesh and blood Moses to do that. And that should not surprise us. Think about your own experience, your own salvation. Did God speak the word of life to you? Absolutely. Did God speak to your heart? Absolutely. Did God speak the words of life to you beyond a shadow of a doubt? But how did God do that? Did a voice from heaven, a big audible voice from heaven come to you and say, repent? No. 
the voice of God came to you on the lips of another. Some created, real, flesh and blood person. God used to speak the word of life, speak the gospel to you. And that's how God typically works. This Sunday at Old Zion is, is Communion Sunday. We're having the Lord's Supper. And it's very real physical created bread. It's very real. The, the cup is very real and physical. The fruit of the vine, it's there. It, it doesn't change. There's no hocus pocus. There's no magic involved. But even in that very real physical stuff, God attaches his promise and his real presence to those very real physical things and when we take the bread and we take the cup we're tasting the promise of God and we are being united fellowshipping with Christ in a very real way through physical stuff so is God the deliverer yes but he's using a very real flesh and blood instrument to do that child of God you are the very real physical flesh and blood instrument of God you are you are the body of Christ, right? Uh, does Christ have a body? Absolutely. He's got a glorified body in heaven. Well, what about on earth? He still has a body on earth. It's us. We're his hands. We're his mouth. We're his eyes. We're his, we're his legs. We're his feet. We are the body of Christ. Okay? Now, Moses protests, just like you and I often do. He protests. And he says, but now, wait a minute, God, who in the world am I to go do this? I mean, he's a fugitive from justice. He's been a shepherd for 40 years. I mean, forget the fact that he was raised as Pharaoh's son. He's been a shepherd for 40 years out here in the wilderness. He was even rejected by his own people. One, they were still slaves. Uh, he kills the Egyptian for mistreating a uh, Hebrew slave. And a few days later, he sees two Hebrew slaves fighting with each other. And he breaks them up and said, look, you're brethren. Why, why are you fighting each other like this? And they said, who made you a ruler over us? We saw what you did to that Egyptian. And that's when Moses fled. He knew the gig was up. And so Moses is saying here, God, shouldn't you pick somebody more qualified than I am? I'm just a shepherd out here in the middle of nowhere in the land of Midian. Shouldn't you pick somebody more qualified? Well, what Moses did not understand was that God had been preparing him for this his whole life. God had been preparing him for this his whole life. Moses couldn't see it there. Right? The natural man did not grasp the purposes and will of of God. Now, it's been said before, and I don't even know who this quote is original with. It's been around so long. Uh, but it's been said that Moses spent the first 40 years of his life thinking he was a somebody, Prince of Egypt. Then he spent the next 40 years of his life learning that he really was a nobody, right? A shepherd in the land of Midian. And now he's going to spend the last 40 years of his life seeing what God can do with a nobody. And if you've been a child of God very long, you have probably seen that play out in your own life as well, right? You're young, you first get converted, man, you man, you somebody. You've got all the answers. You know what's going on. Then after a while, God uses life and uh, the trials of life and the situations of life to teach you that, you know, maybe I really am not the somebody I thought I was. Maybe I don't have all the answers to all things. And it's in that humility in that humility that God works in us, that then he really begins to use us and show us what God can really do through a nobody, right? Now, that's the text. That's, that's what's going on in the text. That's, that's the broad overview there. So is there a big lesson? Is there like one big thing we can really pull out of this? I, I think there is. And I think that one big lesson that we learn today is just trust God. He knows what he's doing. Right? Trust God. He knows what he's doing. Moses could not fathom how he could ever do what God was telling him to do. Right? Like I said, the ways of God are a mystery to natural man. Um, God is above our reason and our logic. Now, we're not saying God is illogical or unreasonable. He's not. But we're just saying that the best logic and the best reason and the best thoughts that we can have still cannot fully grasp this infinite God. Finite mind cannot grasp the infinite God. Can't do that. Uh, his ways are past finding out. They're higher than our ways, Scripture says. Now, but when we have faith in God's word, in what God has said, then we know that his will is going to be accomplished. It's going to be okay. Right? We just believe God. Take him at his word and do what he says. 
I'm reminded of the story of the marriage at Cana. Uh, when Christ performed that first miracle, he's at the at the marriage ceremony in, in the in the town of Cana, and during the ceremony they ran out of wine, and Mary comes to Jesus and says, "You need to do something," and then she turns to the servants and says, "Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Just be obedient. It may not make sense. You may not see how it's going to work out, but you just do what he says. And I'm sure as they were filling those water pots like Jesus commanded them to do, they thought, this is the craziest thing we've ever heard. We're out of wine, and now he's got us drawing water and filling up all these water pots. What in the world good is this going to do? But when they drew out of those water pots, it was no longer water. It was wine, right? Just do what he says, it may not make sense. You may look at the scriptures and God says, do this and live. And you think, well, God, that doesn't make sense. Or the world really has changed since that was written. Lord, and, you know, this is a different kind of society than the society that was written to. It doesn't matter. Do what he says. Just do what he says. Now, I'm not telling you to follow your heart. I'm not telling you to act upon every moving that you feel in your spirit. We test everything by the word of God. But when God moves... And when God speaks in his word, just do what he says. Well, preacher, I'm not qualified. Hey, the hand of providence has prepared you for this thing God has called you for. Right? Your whole life has been training for what God has told you to do. Just do what he says. Forty years as Pharaoh's son and forty years as a shepherd. Moses assumed he was a failure. And I think most of us, I know I've, I've this is... This is my story. I'm sure it's yours, too. Most of us can look back at life. And boy, we see all the mistakes. We see all the missed opportunities. We see all the decisions we should have made differently. And we think, man, you know, I really have failed a lot. And there's been a lot that, I, that I'm a failure at. And Moses assumed he was a failure. He went from being a prince of Egypt, and now he's just the nomadic shepherd in the wilderness here around Horeb. Right? He thought he'd been a failure. But only when he believed God did all the ups and the downs make sense. I want you to know, child of God, all the quote-unquote missed, uh, missed opportunities and bad decisions and uh, the ups and downs and the twists and the turns of life, the good, the bad, all of those things have been brought to you by the hand of God to bring you to the place that you are to do the work that God has laid out for you to do, to perfect you for the ministry that God has laid out for you, whether that's uh, some kind of public ordained ministry or whether that's just uh, doing good for your neighbor, doing works of mercy, speaking the gospel to lost people, whatever it is, God has prepared you providentially over the course of your whole life to do this work that he's called you to do. Listen, faithful followers of Christ and faithful leaders of God's people, or in keeping with the lesson title, maybe we could say obedient followers of Christ and obedient leaders of God's people. They're not made in a day. They're not made in a day. That's why the scripture says don't take a brand new convert and make him the pastor of the church the next day. Don't do that. Why? Well, faithful leaders and faithful followers of Christ, they're not made in a day. They're made in a lifetime. They're made in a lifetime. Right? It takes a lifetime to make a follower of Christ. It takes a lifetime to make a leader in God's people. It does. Um, used to sing a song when we were kids. Maybe y'all sung it too. I don't know. But you sang a song, He's Still Working On Me. You remember that song? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Right? Don't judge me yet. There's an unfinished part. And that's, that's what God's doing. Your whole life. From birth, through your conversion, all the way down to when you leave this life and you go to glory. God is equipping, changing, molding, shaping, growing you uh, into what you need to be, what he has called you to be for the purposes he's ordained for you. Right? We call that sanctification. He's making you holy. He's fitting you for heaven. I remember old preachers used to talk about this life is just the dressing room. It's the dressing room for glory. We're getting ready for glory, but God is molding us, shaping us. It's a lifelong process as we follow the Lord. So you be faithful to God. Be faithful to God. Be obedient to God. Where you are, in whatever season of life you're in, right? Don't say, well, I'm too young to do anything for the Lord. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, right? 
Uh, even those who are just starting out with the Lord, you can you can tell your neighbors the gospel, right? You can share the gospel. You can live the gospel. You can be salt and light where you're at. Whether you're in the middle stages of life or whether you're in uh, the later stages of life, you may be a seasoned saint. Doesn't matter. There's still a work for you to do in the kingdom. Be obedient to God in whatever area he's placed you in and in whatever area he's called you in. Be faithful and in God's time, took 80 years for Moses, in God's time, his will for you will be accomplished. Remember the Apostle Paul says, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So what is the big idea we pull away from this? Be faithful. Be obedient. Just do what God has said. God knows what he's doing, and you can trust him. Be obedient to what God has said. All right? Well, that's the lesson this week, and I trust it's been beneficial to you. I trust that uh, you have been blessed by that and have learned from that and been confirmed in your faith. And I do want to invite you, as always, to come worship with us in person at Old Zion, 8970 Old Bowling Green Road, Glasgow, Kentucky, about six miles out of Glasgow in Barron County. Come be a part of our worship. Uh, we strive to the best of our ability to worship God in ways that God has dictated for us to worship. We sing, we pray, we confess our faith, we, we practice the ordinances of the church and this Sunday is is the Lord's Supper and so come be a part of our worship with us and, uh, and we'll be excited to have you there right we, we'll love on you and we'll be excited to have you in our worship if you have a Bible believing Bible teaching church you be a part of that you attend that be faithful to it but if you don't come see us at Old Zion if you at all are within driving distance of Barron County Kentucky okay well God bless you is my prayer uh, join us here on the YouTube channel for the worship services if you can and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. God bless you.